Christmas time, that time of year where you run out of money before you run out of friends. You know how it works. You buy gifts that nobody wants for people you don't like with money you don't have. And uh, it's got to be more than that. And that's what we're going to talk about today. You know, it's a funny thing, funny sort of strange not ha-ha, is before Christmas, people always come up to me the weeks preceding, and they ask me this silly question. They say, so Pastor Mark, what are you preaching about on Christmas? And I go like, the birth of Christ? <laughs> you know, I don't actually have a lot of options. And I'll tell you why this is funny, strange, maybe funny, haha. About 20 years ago, while my dad was still alive, he had actually never come and heard me preach, never. And uh, finally, on a Christmas Eve, uninvited, unannounced, he shows up. And he sits at the back, and I was so excited to see him, and I preached the Christmas message, of course, and, and after I went and said hi and invited him over for, uh, you know, eggnog after the service, and we had a great time together. And then to my surprise, the next Christmas Eve, and there are only two times he ever came to church, he came the next year, again on Christmas Eve. And so at the end of that service, I, I went and I, I said, Dad, you're, you're here again. I said, so uh, what would you think of the service? He said, well, truthfully, he said, you spoke on that story of the birth of Christ last week, uh, last year rather. And he says, honestly, Mark, you need some new material. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, I really don't have a lot to work with here. And I'll tell you, that little moment with my dad, those two Christmas Eves, has kind of haunted me for 20 years. Because every Christmas, now I'm scratching my head thinking, what am I going to preach about? How can I present this story in a, in a new and a creative way that is going to be meaningful? But let me remind you of something. We should never tire of the amazing story of mystery and wonder of the birth of Christ coming into this world. Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, God coming as a child and living and then going and saving us from our sins. I mean, we should never get tired, never get sick of that story, right? And, you know, if you think about it, that one singular event is what has divided all of history for all time. Everything that happened before Christ, B.C., and everything that happened after A.D. And that one moment in history has divided all time. And it's interesting to me that 2,000 years later, in a post-Christian culture, we're still celebrating Christmas. Isn't that kind of neat that for 2,000 years this has endured? Now, we have lost a few things along the way, right? Because we traded Jesus for Santa, and we traded angels for elves, and we traded wise men for reindeer, and we traded the manger for the mall. But at least it's still Christmas. And, uh, and the one thing we've never lost, and I don't think we ever will, is the tradition of gift giving, right? I think that's going to hang on and linger. What do you think? And, you know, who do we have to blame for that? The wise men, right? They started it first Christmas. They brought the gifts. And, uh, but I'm wondering if you've ever noticed this, that when they got to the manger, they did not say, hey, nice baby. Okay, let's exchange gifts. And they didn't exchange with one another. So, Ahmed, what'd you get me? And, uh, you know, they actually gave the gifts to the child. And, you know, Christmas is really about gift giving because Christmas is the greatest gift that God has ever given to mankind. And that moment in history is, is so important for us. And so if we get a little excited on Christmas, particularly as Christians, I think that's a good thing. How many of you grew up in one of those homes where Christmas Day was the biggest day of the year? How many of you grew up in that home? Oh, so most of you grew up in that home. And I'll tell you, when I was growing up, I mean, Christmas, we could not wait. We could not get to sleep. We were up at four in the morning, and we were inconsolably excited about Christmas. And my parents just couldn't kind of calm us down. Six kids, just kind of completely hyper. And so finally, they came up with this strategy, tradition, that maybe some of you did. They allowed us to open one gift on Christmas Eve to kind of calm us down, and maybe we'd go to bed and wake up at 8, not 4 in the morning. How, how many of you did that? How many growing up, you, you opened one gift on Christmas Eve? A bunch of you did that? So you, you had the same parents that I did, right? So, so I got to tell you one story. I was about 10 years old, and uh, it was the big Christmas Eve thing. We got to open one gift. Remember, they got six kids, and there was the three, three of us were the oldest three, and uh, that particular Christmas, the three brothers, my older brother, my younger brother, and myself, we all had the same gift under the tree, at least that's what it looked like, and it was in a great, big, huge box. And how many of you know that this is a universal truth, that the biggest gift is the best, right? Isn't that how the 10-year-old mind works? And so we're looking at these gifts under the tree, we're seeing these big boxes, and we're thinking, we're going straight for that gift. 
So Christmas Eve came, we all went and grabbed that big huge box, the three of us, and we sat down, the other kids got something else, and we were sitting there with those big boxes, and my mother, to her credit, tried to talk us out of it. She said, you know what, you don't really want to open that one. Oh, nice try, Mom. Oh, we know what she was trying to do, prevent us from opening the good one, right? And so, you know, we know she was using a little reverse psychology, well, we're going to open this one. And, that's, and so she couldn't talk us out of it. She said, well, okay. If you're going to open that, you should all do it together. Now, we're thinking, this is what's going through our head. We're thinking, this is probably a road race set or a train set. And probably you need all these pieces. And we're probably going to have this huge road race set. It's going to fill up the whole living room. It's going to be amazing. And she says, you better open them all at once because they're all the same gift. So then the three of us went, one, two, three. And we tore those boxes open. And inside was a brand new sleeping bag. <laughs> it, was, it was so disappointing, I can't tell you. Turns out my parents were planning on sending us all the way to camp in the summer, right? So they were just getting ready. It was really a gift to them. And uh, so, so anyway, we're sitting there looking at these sleeping bags. Imagine these like 10-year-old-ish kids looking at a sleeping bag. And I looked at my dad and I said, what am I going to do with this? He says, well, you might as well go to bed because you got the sleeping bag. So we went to bed and slept in our brand new sleeping bag. But I'll never forget that Christmas because of the big surprise. And you know what? That's what Christmas should be about. It should be about mystery and it should be about surprise. So, so what I'm going to do this year is I'm borrowing my message title from something you all are familiar with, The Lone Ranger. Now, some of you think that's not a Christmas scene. Well, it will be by the time I'm done here. And you all remember The Lone Ranger. It was 1933, began as a radio show, and then became a TV show. And more recently, it even was a movie with Johnny Depp. And here's the original Lone Ranger. There he is. His name was John Reed, and he was a, a Texas Ranger who went around with that mask on. You would never guess who he is with that mask, right? No way if you knew him, you were going to get him. And then, of course, he had his trusty sidekick, Tonto. And uh, so The Lone Ranger and Tonto, they would go and they solve crimes and save the distressed and whatever. And then you remember how it all ended, right? At the end of every program, this is what had happened. He would ride off into the sunset and he'd say, hi ho silver, away! And off he went and the bewildered people who were rescued would be standing there wide-eyed and say it with me, and out of their mouths would come, who was that masked man, right? And so here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Jesus, the masked man. Because like any superhero crime fighter, like Jesus was, you've got to come in disguise. And if you don't think Jesus came in disguise, I want you to rethink this. Because you know what? People didn't know who he was. And all through his life, they were basically saying the same thing. Who was this masked man? They were asking that same question. You will remember when he did miracles in his hometown, they said, is this not Joseph's son, the carpenter's son? They knew who this guy was, and they were surprised and, be, and bewildered. Even his own cousin... John the Baptist, whose mission was to declare the Messiah. Of all people, he should have known. And he sends the message and says, are you the one? Or do we look for another? In other words, who was that masked man? And so there was a reason that Jesus came in disguise. He really did have a reason because he was on a secret mission to earth. And he was doing a sting operation. Make no mistake about this. And he had to reveal on one hand to some his identity, but had to be very careful that not everybody found out. He didn't even call himself the Son of God. What did he call himself? He called himself the Son of Man. He was trying to play the humanity card. He was just trying to be like one of them. He was throwing them off guard all the time. And of course, right at the beginning, Mark chapter 1, he heals the leper. And he says to the leper, make sure you tell no one. Who remembers what the leper did? He went and told everybody. Wouldn't you? You got healed of leprosy? You're going to tell everybody. So his fame went out amongst the land, and, and people were busy guessing. Now let me, right at the beginning here, let me explain to you why it was important for him to maintain his secret identity, because he was on a mission, and what he had to do was he had to trick the powers that be into crucifying him. Because if he could do that, and if he could be crucified as an innocent man, then he could vicariously die in your place and take away your sins. Because he himself had no sin, so he would take on our sin. But he had to trick them into doing it, which he did. And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he said, Had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And so this whole secret identity thing was actually very important to Christ's mission. Now, I know that he didn't wear a literal mask. I'm smart enough to know that, and you know that too. And we don't imagine Jesus with a mask on literally, but he definitely had a mask on figuratively. People weren't sure who he was. 
So I'm going to take a moment and just talk about masks for a moment because we look at all crime fighters and they mostly have masks. Have you noticed this? So let's go through a few of them. I'm going to look at Spider-Man first. So we look at Spider-Man. Peter Parker came up with a pretty good disguise, right? You look at that, there's no way you're thinking Tobey Maguire, right? Nobody's thinking that. You look at Batman. So we got Batman here. He's got a pretty good mask. No as good as Spider-Man, but it's pretty good. Could be Christian Bale, or it could be Val Kilmer, or Michael Keaton, or Ben Affleck. You know, could be any of these guys. You know, chin, mouth, could be anybody, right? So he's doing a pretty good job. And then we have Superman, right? Seriously, Clark? You think you're pulling this one off? You part your hair on the other side, put these dorky glasses on, and you're trying to convince us you're not Superman? Yet, somehow, he manages to keep his identity with no mask at all. How does he do it? He's Superman. That's how. That's how you do it. And so if Superman can pull it off, if the Lone Ranger can pull it off, then I'm pretty sure Jesus is able to pull it off, which he is. So I have a little Lone Ranger story for you here. So, so the Lone Ranger and Tonto, they were out camping one night. And in the middle of the night, uh, Tonto wakes up the Lone Ranger and says, Kimasabi, wake up. And he says, what is it, Tonto? He says, look up. And he looks up and he says, what? He says, what do you see? He says, I see stars. And Tonto says, what does that tell you? And he says, well, chronologically, it tells me that it's half past three. He says, meteorologically, it tells me tomorrow's going to be a beautiful day. Astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of stars in the galaxy and millions of galaxies in the universe. And theologically, it tells me that God is great and awesome, creator of all things, and we are insignificant in comparison. What does it tell you, Tonto? To which Tonto said, it tell me you dumber than buffalo. It tell me someone stole tent. <laughs> oh, thank you for getting that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask this question, who was that masked man? And I'm going to answer it three ways. And as I answer it, they're actually going to be a bit redundant and on purpose because they build on one another and we're going somewhere with this. And here it is. I'm going to throw it up on the screen. Who was that masked man? And here's what we're going to look at. Number one, only faith can unmask him. Number two, only seekers will find him. And number three, only heaven can reveal him. So we're going to start with a verse here that is in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Not exactly the Christmas story, but I'm telling you, it relates to it. And so here it is. Uh, Hebrews 11, 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So what this verse tells us, is that only faith will reveal his identity. You're never going to know who it is, who he is without faith. And even his disciples, I want you to think about this. Even these guys that lived with him and traveled with him for three and a half years struggled to figure out and struggled to have the faith to figure out who he was and who he was in his real identity. Now, let me give you an example of this, and it's in, it's in Matthew chapter 8. We're about several weeks or maybe a couple of months into Jesus' ministry. And uh, they get into this boat on the Sea of Galilee, and they go out into the Sea of Galilee, and uh, the, a huge storm comes up, waves are coming into the boat. Who remembers what Jesus was doing? Anybody remember? <laughs> yeah, he was sleeping in, sleeping in the stern of the boat. And I think if these disciples thought the boat was going down, it probably was, because they spent every day on the Sea of Galilee. And they go and they wake up Jesus, and they say, Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? Jesus jumps to his feet, and he rebukes them. And he says, why are you so fearful? O oh, you of little faith. And then he says, peace, be still. And the winds and the waves went calm. And then these guys looked at him, and remember this, this line, and they said, who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey? Or in other words, who was that masked man? I mean, they're asking this question. They're not sure who he is. And I'll tell you why this is kind of perplexing. It's because if you go read Matthew chapter 7, the chapter right before that, and you read what Jesus had done in their presence, it's remarkable. It starts off, Matthew chapter 7, by Jesus healing the leper. And then he heals the centurion's servant. You remember that? Just say the word, my servant will be healed. And then it says, multitudes came from all of Galilee, and he cast out their demons, and he healed all of their sickness. And then he went to Peter's house, Peter's own house in Capernaum, and he healed Peter's own mother-in-law. Now, many scholars believe that's why Peter denied him three times. <laughs> I'm not 100% convinced, but... You know, they got an argument, don't they? And, and, and so here's what I don't want you to miss. They had seen miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, and they get into one tight, tight spot, and they stop believing. And why is it? What was wrong? 
Why couldn't they believe? And I'll tell you why. Because Jesus, as the Son of God, was actually out of context. You see, if, if he had come on a white horse with many crowns on his head and his eyes a flame of fire and the armies of heaven behind him and on his robe written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, which he will, incidentally, the second time when he comes, do you think people would have recognized him? Yeah, I think they would have recognized, but that's not the way he came. He came as a baby, born in a manger. He grew up in Nazareth. See, everybody knew him as Joseph's son, the carpenter's son. These guys knew his family. They were at the wedding of Canaan. They knew his brothers. They knew his family. And now they have this moment where the winds and the waves are obeying, and they're going, who is this man? Even his disciples didn't know who he was. And I think it was just because the Son of God was out of context. And I got a little story to tell you about this that's rather amusing. So a few years ago, we're in the Edmonton. We're doing our dog and pony show where we go out on the road and we take our music and we take my, my preaching. And we were in the Jubilee Auditorium in Edmonton, which is a fabulous facility. It looks like the Winnipeg Concert Hall. Beautiful facility with this group, huge group of hundreds of people that come out. And so what I always do is I always go into the foyer after these events and I, I, I shake people's hands, and people will line up for half an hour or an hour to sh shake my hands. And there I'm busy, you know, with my big fake smile, and I'm, you know, kissing women and slapping babies. No, wait a minute. Kissing babies, slapping backs. I forget how that goes, but I was doing one of those things. And so there I am, I've got this big lineup. I know some of you are thinking, come on. Let me just tell you something. Outside of this building, I'm hot stuff. You know that? I just want you to know that. I mean, I know I'm hey you to you. But so anyway, I've got this lineup of people, and I'm smiling and shaking hands. And this really nice young man, he comes up, and he shakes my hand. And he tells me how he enjoyed the event. We're having this little conversation for a couple minutes. And I'm not recognizing who he is. I don't know who he is. And then there's a woman standing right beside him. And she reaches out her hand, and she shakes my hand. And this is what she says. She says, hi, I'm Jerome's wife. To which I said, Jerome who? To which she said, Aginla, Jerome Aginla, the guy you're talking to. <laughs> and here's the picture of them. That's Kara, his wife. There's Jerome Aginla. And I, I, well, I didn't recognize him. I had been talking to him for about two minutes, did not recognize him because he was dressed like that. He was with his wife. He was out of context. He wasn't in Calgary. He was in Edmonton. Turns out he actually lives in Edmonton. And I don't want you to miss this. Here I am greeting people who are coming to see me, and I'm standing in front of probably one of the most famous faces in all of Canada, 100,000 times more famous than me, and I don't recognize him. Why didn't I recognize him? Because he was out of his disguise. See, if he'd had his mask on, like in this picture, I would have recognized him. <laughs> if he was in his Calgary Flames jersey and his, and his uniform and his mask, I would have got it. But out of context, I did not recognize him. And so, you know, I, after that incident, I've become less judgmental of the disciples. You know, I always thought these guys were such morons. I thought, what's wrong with these guys? Can't they figure out this is Jesus? We read the story, right? We read the story, we go, of course, it's, of course it's the Son of God, of course it's Jesus. What's wrong with you guys? And I had my little incident and I thought, okay, maybe I'm not so smart after all. And I realized that out of context, we oftentimes do not recognize people. And these guys were struggling because they knew. And I know how we think. We think, you know, if we could just go back in time, and if we could have been there when Jesus walked the earth, and if we could have seen him in the flesh, and if we could have seen his miracles, we'd be so full of faith. No, you wouldn't. We wouldn't have been any different than the disciples because only faith can, can unmask him. See, you have to believe in him even though you can't have it proven. And see, this is why atheists, you know, the atheists I know are actually pretty smart people. Most of them are way smarter than I am. But here's what I've discovered. They have to have absolute, empirical, scientific proof before they're going to believe. And the rule of thumb is this. I'll believe it when I see it. But you know what? That's not how faith works. Faith works exactly the opposite. You will see it when you believe it. And what happens, and I know you're like this, once you've made that decision to believe, all of a sudden everything comes clear. All of a sudden it makes so much sense to you. And that's why people struggle in this world, because they want to see the truth, and they spend so much time arguing against it instead of accepting the reality of this amazing story. And once we accept it by faith, our eyes are open. 
It's like the story I love to tell about the, the atheist. He's walking through the woods one day, contemplating the fluke of nature, which we call creation. And he's walking through one day and just enjoying his Sunday afternoon, and he comes across a grizzly bear. And the grizzly bear rises up on its hind legs with its fangs out and its, and its talons out, and it's ready to pounce on him. And in that moment, he realizes he's in a big trouble. So he drops to his knees and he folds his arms and he says, Lord, I know that it's presumptuous for me to pray and to call on you in this moment after all I've thought about you. But could you at least make this a Christian bear? And then in that moment, the bear dropped to its knees, folded its paws and said, Lord, for this food that I'm about to receive, make me truly thankful. So the first thing is that only faith can unmask him. The second thing is this, only seekers will find him. I want to go back to our text here for a moment. Let's go look at this one more time here. And it says this, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And he who comes to God must believe that he is. And we talked about that. And then it goes like this. And that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And see, Jesus told us this. In other places, he said, seek and you will find. Seek and you will find. And as you go through the story of the gospel, you discover person after person came seeking after Jesus. And here's what I want to propose to you, that every time someone went and sought after him, guess what? They actually found what they were looking for. Am I right about that? I mean, think about Nicodemus. Nicodemus was one of the rulers of the Jews. And he came to him at night so that no one would recognize him. And he wanted to know about eternal life. And he sought out Jesus and he got the answer on eternal life. We have the story of, of Zacchaeus, for example. He was the sinful tax collector, and he sought out Jesus, climbed the sycamore tree, and he discovered eternal life. We have the centurion, who was a Roman, and he sought out uh, Jesus, and as a result, his servant was healed. We have blind Bartimaeus, who cried out, sought him out. Even though he couldn't see, he sought him. And he said, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus restored his sight. We have the woman with the issue of blood. Twelve years she had been bleeding, spending all her money on doctors. And she saw him, she sought him out, and she pushed her way through the crowd. And she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. She touched the hem of his garment, and she was healed. You see, when people seek out Jesus, they find him. And it's no different today. And you know, you can go right back to the very beginning, right back to the story of the birth of Christ. Because the first people to seek and find Jesus were the wise men, remember? They had been looking for how long? Two years. They'd followed the star for two years. And there they were, kings from the east. And they saw the star and they followed, not knowing where it was going to end, except they knew they were looking for the king of the Jews. And that star led them right to the city of Jerusalem. And when they got there, they went and talked to Herod. Now, the fact that they had an audience with Herod, you know what that tells me? That tells me these were people of note and significance. And so he says to, they said to Herod, where is he who was born the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east. And Herod's like perplexed. And he says, I, I don't even know. And he turns to his scholars and his scholars say, well, he should be born in Bethlehem. Which is interesting because Jesus actually, his family was from Nazareth. But they happened to be in Bethlehem for the census. And that's actually where Jesus was born. And so we have them go and they seek him out and they find him. And this is what it says. It says, when they found him, they bowed down before the child and they worshiped him with exceedingly great joy. See, they found what they had been looking for for two years. Now, contrast that with Herod, who did not come, even though he knew, even though these kings said, look, and he now knew it was in Bethlehem, he did not go. And this is what it says. It says that Herod and all of Jerusalem with him were greatly troubled. Why were they greatly troubled? The people that came and sought him out, because the, the shepherds came too, remember that? Shepherds came and, 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 and they found him and they worshipped him and they experienced great joy and the wise men experienced great joy. And so what we discover is there's really just two kinds of people. Those who seek him out and find him and find great joy. And those who at Christmas time do not seek him and they do not find that joy. And that's why, you know, when we look at people today and they get all caught up in Christmas and they can't seem to find the joy in it because joy is not something that's found under the tree. And if it was, then they wouldn't be in line at you know, Best Buy on Boxing Day, right? 
Let me tell you a story that many of you will know. How many of you know who Lee Strobel is, the, the, the writer Lee Strobel? Lee Strobel's story is kind of a great one because Lee was a uh, um, journalist with the Chicago Tribune. He was a, the uh, legal affairs writer. He was a well-educated, smart guy, but he's also an atheist and an avowed atheist, and he was pretty staunch in his perspective. His wife was not an atheist. His wife, Leslie, was an agnostic. She didn't know where she really was. And anyway, in 1979, his wife, Leslie, finds Christ and her whole life turns around. And she's got this joy, this inexplicable joy that only comes when you find Christ. And her husband, Lee, can't understand it. Not only did he not understand it, he didn't like it. And he says, I just want my old wife back. Kind of ironic, right? That she finds joy and he's mad and miserable that she's found joy. Let's both stay miserable. That's better because misery loves company, right? So then he decides, she doesn't look like she's budging. So Lee decides he's going to go on a little mission and he's going to investigate the claims of Christ. And he's a journalist, so he can research this. He spends the next 19 months investigating the claims of Christ, trying to disprove the existence of Jesus and him being the Son of God. And after 19 months, guess what happened? The penny dropped, and all of a sudden, he realized that all the claims of Christ were actually true. Now, I don't want you to miss what happened. He was seeking after Christ to disprove him, but because he sought after the truth, he actually discovered it. And when he discovered it, he made that decision. And in 1981, Lee Strobel gave his heart to Christ. And he found that inexplicable joy. And then he changed careers from a writer with the Chicago Tribune to becoming a teaching pastor at Willow Creek, Bill Hybels, big mega church. And he did this for a number of years. And then in 1998, he decides to write a book about his experience trying to disprove this, and it's called A Case for Christ. How many of you have read that book? A bunch of people in the room. And then it was made into a major Hollywood motion picture, and here's the billboard for that, The Case for Christ, and did extremely well. And then he wrote another one called The Case for Christmas, and uh, some of you saw this one. It was on uh, Hallmark Channel, starring Deegan Cain. And, uh, and here, he's, he, here he is, someone who sought after Christ, and even though he wasn't actually trying to find him, he ended up finding him because seek and you shall find. You know, I was thinking about this, and I thought it was sort of ironic that, as well, because there's another writer who writes for the Miami Herald. His name is Dave Barry. How many of you know the humorous Dave Barry? Dave Barry has a, a comic twist on everything. I've actually got all his books. I've read them all, big surprise. And he's just such a nut. And he wrote a Christmas book. And here's his Christmas book. It's called The Shepherd, the Angel, and Walter, the Christmas Miracle Dog. As only, as only Dave Barry can put this twist on it. And I'll tell you what he does in this book. I'll save you the trouble of reading it if you don't want to read it. He laments the fact that Christmas has turned into a nondescript holiday. And we go around saying season's greetings and happy holidays. And we've missed out on the fact that it's actually Christmas. This is a secular writer who's saying these things. And this is the way he puts it. He says, in the old days, Christmas was a religious holiday. The Christians called it Christmas and went to church. The Jews called it Hanukkah and went to the synagogue. And the atheists called it party time and went and got drunk. And he says, so when we met each other on the street, it was Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, or to the atheists, look out for that wall. <laughs> and this is what we discover, is that when, when we seek after Christ, if we will genuinely make that effort, we will find him and we will find that joy. And I mean, think about this. You take Christ out of Christmas, what do you have? Not much left, is there? You know, I don't know if you know this. This is the first year they're not doing a nativity scene in our country's capital in Ottawa. And you know why? Not, not for religious reasons. They just couldn't find three wise men on all of Parliament Hill. <laughs> but they had no trouble finding enough jackasses to fill the stable. <laughs> had to get my dig in. And so, so who has that masked man? The first, the first thing is they said only faith can unmask him. The second thing is that only seekers will find him. And the last and final thing is this. And as I said, they build on each other. And the last thing is this, that only heaven can reveal him. So I told you that early on in, in Jesus' ministry, the disciples did not recognize him. So now we're about two years later. It's Matthew 16. And he's sitting around with the boys, and he has a question for them. And he says this. He says, who do men say I the son of man am. And so they answer and they say, well, some say John the Baptist and some say Elijah or, or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he says, yeah, yeah, but, but who do you say I am? And Peter speaks up and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. 
Now Jesus gets genuinely excited because P Peter has never got a question right in his life. And he gets this one right. And, and so Jesus is excited and says, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Did you catch that? Peter didn't actually figure it out on his own, but God from heaven revealed the identity of Christ to him, and he was the first to know. So then you follow this story, and by the time you get to the, the death and the resurrection, they still aren't sure. And, and I'm convinced of this, that when Peter denied Jesus three times, I don't think it had anything to do with the fact that he didn't believe and everything to do with self-preservation. How many think I'm right about that one? I think he was just trying to save his butt, and I think that's all it was about. But there were others who didn't believe. Thomas didn't believe. And he says, unless I see his body and touch the holes in his hands, I'm not going to believe. And then so Jesus appears to him and says, you know, blessed are you for seeing you believe. More blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. And then in Luke 24, if that weren't remarkable enough, in Luke 24, after the death, after the resurrection, after Jesus had already been walking on the earth, there was still at least two disciples that weren't clear on who he was. And you remember the story. It was the, the road to Emmaus. And we have the two disciples. They're walking down the road to Emmaus, and they're talking about the events of the few, last few days. And it says, Jesus comes and joins them. Are you ready for this? And it says, and they did not recognize him. And so then he said, what are you guys talking about? So they're telling the story about his death and his resurrection and all of this stuff. And he's pretending he doesn't know what's going on. And they said, where have you been? Under a rock, man? And he's telling this story. And then he stops. Jesus stops. They still don't know who he is. And then it says, and then starting with Moses and continuing through all the prophets, he expounded the scriptures on all things concerning himself. And in other words, he went through the Old Testament, because that was the scripture of the day. He went, he went through the Old Testament, and he pointed his, his appearance out all the way through the Old Testament. And then he took bread, and he broke the bread, and he gave it to him. And then it says, and their eyes were open, and they knew it was the Lord, and they rejoiced. See, what happened was heaven in that moment revealed Christ to them. So I'm going to ask the question and answer it the same way Jesus might have on the road to Emmaus. And I'm going to ask this, who was that masked man in closing? And I'm going to tell you who that masked man is. Who was that masked man? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in the book of Genesis, it was He who created the heavens and the earth. And it was He who proclaimed, let there be light, and there was light. And He walked in the cool of the day with Adam. That's who that masked man was. Who was that masked man? I'll tell you who that masked man was. He was the burning bush in Exodus, and he was the Lord of feasts in Leviticus. He was the pillar of fire in Numbers, and he was the rod that budded in Deuteronomy. That's who that masked man was. Who was that masked man? I'll tell you who that masked man was. He was the captain of the host in Joshua, the sword of Gideon in Judges, the kinsman redeemer in Ruth, and he was the sword of David in Samuel. That's who that masked man was. Who was that masked man? I'm glad you asked, because I'm going to tell you who that masked man was. He was the mantle of Elijah and Kings, the Shekinah glory in Chronicles. He was the God of heaven in Ezra and the joy of the Lord in Nehemiah. That's who that masked man was. Who was that masked man? I'll tell you who that masked man was. He was the golden scepter of deliverance in Esther, the voice of the whirlwind in Job. He was the rock and fortress in Psalms. He was wisdom in Proverbs. He was crater in Ecclesiastes, the beloved in the Song of Solomon. That's who that masked man was. Who was that masked man? I'll tell you who that masked man was. He was the Prince of Peace in Isaiah, Lord of Righteousness in Jeremiah. He was the Lord of Heaven in Lamentations. He was the true shepherd in Ezekiel. He was the fourth man in the midst of the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel. That's who that masked man was. Who was that masked man? I'll tell you who that masked man was. He was the faithful husband in Hosea. He was the Lord of the day of the Lord in Joel. He was the tabernacle of David in Amos. He was the hidden treasure in Obadiah. He was the Lord of salvation in Jonah. And he was the glory of Israel in Nahum. That's who that masked man was. Who was that masked man? I'll tell you who that masked man was. He was a burden of the Lord in Nahum. He was the awaited vision in Habakkuk. He was a mighty one in Zephaniah, desire of the nations in Haggai, the olive branch in Zechariah. And he was the son of righteousness that will rise with healing in his wings in the book of Malachi. That's who that masked man was. 
But I'm not done. I'll tell you who that masked man was. That masked man was Jehovah Jireh, the Lord your provider. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord your presence. Jehovah Tzikhanu, the Lord your righteousness. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord your peace. Jehovah Mekadesh, the Lord your sanctifier. Jehovah Rohe, the Lord your shepherd. Jehovah Rophe, the Lord your healer. Jehovah Nisa, the Lord your banner. That's who that masked man was. Who was that masked man? I'm not done here. I'm going to tell you who that masked man was. He was a wonderful counselor, mighty God, Rose of Sharon, Lily of the Valley, bright morning star, ancient of days, son of David, Lord of glory, prince of peace, king of kings, and Lord of lords. That's who that masked man was. I was so glad you asked that question because I wanted to be able to answer it. Let me just close with this one final thought. You know the gospel is actually very simple and we've complicated it. And our first father and mother, Adam and Eve in the garden, they sinned and they failed and they committed high treason. And we think it's unjust that we should be punished for their sin. And I got news for you, we are not punished for their sin. But we did inherit their sin nature. And we're punished for our own sin. And all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There are none righteous. No. Not one. And every one of us in our hearts knows that. And so God looked down at that predicament and he sent his own son, his own right arm into the world that he was born as a baby and grew up and he went to the cross for your sin and took away our sin and he brought the remedy for our sin. And he redeemed us and sanctified and declared us righteous. That's who that masked man was. And that's why all these years later, Jesus is still the reason for the season and wise men still seek him today. Merry Christmas, everybody. Why don't you all stand to your feet? We're going to do one more thing, something we do every week in this church. And I'm going to ask you all to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. And if you didn't hear who Christ was today, then I, I, I must have really blown it. But I think you did. And, and, and I'm thinking about this. When I look at a crowd this size, I know there will be people in this room that have never invited Christ into their life to be their Lord and their Savior. And what better time than Christmas? What better time than now to make this decision to be a follower of Jesus? And if you're here today, nobody's looking around. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. This is between you, me, and heaven. If you're here today and you're not sure if you would die tonight or this week or this month or this year, if you'd go to heaven, I'm talking to you. And if you've never made this decision, I want to privately let you make this decision right where you are without calling you forward or singling you out. And if that's you, and you would like to make a decision to follow Christ, you want to invite him into your heart, or maybe you knew him in the past and you've slipped away and you need to come back, I want you to join these folks. And I want you to slip up your hand right now if you want to make that decision. Just wherever you are, just take a moment, slip up your hands. There's hands popping up all over the room. Nobody's looking around. I'm not going to call you forward, but I don't want you to miss out this opportunity. So anybody else wants to join these folks from the front to the back, from side to side? What better time than Christmas to make a decision to be a follower of Jesus? All right, you can all put your hands down. Thank you for being bold and brave. But I said I wouldn't single you out, so we're all going to say this prayer together. So let's pray with these people, all right? Lord Jesus... I thank you for coming into the world as a tiny, helpless baby and living your life to set up for that moment where you would die on the cross for my sin. I thank you for washing it all away and making me cleansed and whole. I thank you that on the third day you rose again and you forever live to be my Lord. I thank you that by faith I can unmask you I thank you that I can seek you and find you. And I thank you that heaven will reveal you. And that today I'm a Christian. And I'm on my way to heaven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a shout, shall we?